Hello, hello, random stranger. I hope your week's been good. Um, we are back for more K on, which we're always happy about. But I do feel this onset of a twinge of sadness whenever I post these reactions now because uh, it's the beginning of the end, isn't it? Um, and as I always say, to have people from all over share in that sadness is a big comfort. So thank you for sticking with me. Um, in the last video, uh, let's see, wait, let me pull up the comments. Uh, yeah, Ogura, Ogura mentioned uh, or commented on how k is a show that you just turn to after a long week at work or study or whatever it is and you're tired and you just need something to enjoy and to lift you up and uh, I gotta say that that's what it's been for me too. Um, Ogura by the way is on their fourth rewatch which I will get to someday. Uh, so even though I'll be moving on to some new animes after k -On, I just know that I'm gonna be coming back to it time and time again um, and I really I can't wait to pick up on even more details and more of the writing hat tricks that I feel I've definitely missed this first time round. On a happy note, Putra Wisnu and uh, it was Mickey M underscore 804 over on Twitter told me that July 2nd was Mickey's birthday. So happy birthday to, oh, dare I say it, my favorite among favorites in the HTT club. My birthday wish for her would be for her to keep at her dreams of working a minimum wage job and using her paychecks to buy as much cheap stuff from the dollar store as her heart desires. Also, if she ever wanted to switch lanes, um, I would totally support her if she wanted to become, say, a Yuri Shakespearean script writer, um, which I think she has a real gift for. I love that people still celebrate the girls' as birthdays even after so long I mean this show and this fandom will never die and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of all of that albeit you know like 12 years later there was another really cool thing that I wanted to show you guys yeah okay so yes so Rex Arcadia linked to an incredible audio clip um, of the K on VAs uh, wait do I have their names I really should know their names by now. They've been so amazing. Uh, yep, yeah, okay, so the KMVA is Minato Kotobuki, Aki Toyosaki, and Satomi Sato, basically making fun of Yoko Hikasa, Mio's VA, um, and they sing Fua Fua Time and basically mess with her, and then by the end, they just reduce her to a blubbering mess. Um, it's an actual K on episode that's been brought to life. <laughs> And whoever clipped that and translated it all is a hero. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I will include a link to that in the notes as well. All right, let's get to some episode notes and uh, more common shout outs. Man, even at this late stage, I'm learning so much about the show and its different wonderful layers. And it's because you guys take the time to share your thoughts with me. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, episode 17. I mean, that episode, it shone a little spotlight on the silent fifth member of the HTT club, which was the music room. Um, it was only after the girls suddenly had that space taken away from them that they and we realized just how important it's been in their journey. Um, it's been the site of so many historic and monumental iconic moments in the girls' lives and, uh, you know, I just want to pay my respects to the room and also to how the k -On writers were able to use that episode to remind us again to appreciate the blessings in your life when you can and when you have them. There was another honorary member of the club that was given some screen time and uh, Sir Eminon highlighted them, which was Tonchan. So it was an interesting comment about how Tonchan adds to the rich symbolism that is found throughout k -On and really brings into focus um, Azus's character evolution. So Samanon wrote, 
I found it adorable that Azusa, upon reaching the top of the stairs at the start of the episode, almost immediately notices that Tonchan is out of his usual aquarium, and she seems genuinely concerned for his well-being, which is a sharp contrast to her initial feelings towards him early on in the season. She also spends the first part of the episode hauling him around as the girls keep looking for a place to practice, and her lyrics ultimately end up being entirely revolved around him too. I think this affection towards Tonchan is a subtle but nonetheless impactful symbolization of how close Azusa has gotten to the light music club as a whole, antics and all. Um, thank you for those notes. Putting aside the fact that I had instinctively thought that Azusa's lyrics were about Yui, I do love how Kaon finds yet another way to showcase the exponential growth of Azusa's love for the club and knowing that she's likely going to be its next president. Um, I, I appreciate how things will come full circle. So the girl who started out the most skeptical about the merits of a club that seemingly just drinks tea and eats cake all day, then becoming its next leader and protector and really its greatest fan. Back to uh, Tonchan, David Garcia added to the lore of why he makes sense as the Light Music Club's uh, mascot. Um, so from the very first episode, we get the visual reminder of the tortoise and the hare used in the school stairways. Slow and steady wins the race certainly applies to the club and tells us that it's not about rushing to the goal, but rather appreciating the journey while we're on it. Yeah, I, I love that even the turtle of the club is imbued with this background meaning that is really consistent with the entire show's philosophy. Episode 17 also set up uh, two songs that I'm hoping we get to listen to, if not today, then very soon. You and I and Rice Song. Um, both songs written by Yui. Uh, at least, mm, yeah, at least You and I was, the Rice Song was, you know, Ui had a huge hand in writing those lyrics. Um, I do like, though, that they're mixing things up from the normal Mio writes the lyrics, Mugi writes the music combo. And uh, on Mio's surprise reaction to the band choosing to perform a Yui written song um, instead of hers, Evan David made a very relevant comparison to how Paul McCartney and the Beatles must have reacted when George Harrison started writing his own songs, um, one of which was Here Comes the Sun, which is one of my personal favourites. Um, so I think Mia's shock at Yui's lyrical writing abilities was like a nice twist because with the Beatles, there was actually quite a bit of tension and rivalry between McCartney and Harrison when it came to the creative process and a few of their songs that they each wrote were diss tracks towards each other. Not that I think Mio and Yui would ever be at each other's throats, but it was like a cool little nod to the often sensitive creative balance in any multi-person band. Another just real insight into the creative process was mentioned by Queen of Autumn Sleeves, uh, who wrote, Episode 17 is so true to the creative process. Although consistency is important, sometimes sitting down and trying to squeeze creativity out of your brain just doesn't work. Yes, as someone who is paid to write, I really, really relate to this struggle. Um, so they continued, it's often a sudden swelling of emotion created by something in your daily life that produces the brightest spark of creativity. Yui doesn't start writing you and I with a pen and paper while stressing about writing lyrics. She writes it spontaneously in her head while she's cooking for her sister. Totally organic and heartfelt. Those sudden outpourings of art where you almost feel like you've been possessed are really beautiful. Um, those are really great points, but in a really good way. It reminded me of how um, some famous writers found that doing something else other than thinking about what they had to write helped a lot. So I'm thinking of some giants in philosophy like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Ludwig Wittgenstein, both whom said that they relied on physical walking, you know, going outside and being inspired by random things. And that's how their ideas would develop. Um, there's also 
Sheldon, Sheldon is not a philosopher. He's, I'm talking about Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. Uh, that episode where he works as the busboy at the Cheesecake Factory and through menial labor and an accident with the dishes, he comes up with a solution to his physics problem. Um, that's been driving him insane. So episode 17 had a lot of little nods to real and practical life lessons, which is what we've come to expect from Kaon, but it's no less amazing how they just slip those in there. And then there was episode 18, which of course I loved, and I can't wait to get to the conclusion of in episode 19. First off, I have to say that the true MVP of episode 18 was Nautica, and I don't talk about Nautica, Nautica enough. There were several things I was very impressed with by her this episode. The way she so smoothly closed off all escape routes for Mio and Ritsu when the rest of the class voted them in to play Romeo and Juliet. Uh, she basically said, that settled, move on which was so cool. Also, Noraka has this killer combination of kindness and intelligence and strategic smarts. Her negotiation skills are world-class. For example, like later when Mio tells her that she just can't be Romeo, Noraka doesn't force Mio, but she does um, go on to present a very clear, convincing case for Mia to at least have a go. So that being assertive, but also very understanding, but also very strategic in how she presents solutions is amazing. The way that Nautica deals with Yui also, we've seen how in the past, you know, she's taken care of her basically since they were babies. <laughs> but in this episode, we find out that Nautica has told Yui to practice holding completely still for her part in the play, um, which tells me how supportive of a friend she is. Like, is the role of Trigi really that important? Probably not. But is it important to Yui? Clearly, yes, because, I mean, how many things does Yui actually take seriously? And so if it's important to Yui, then it's important to Nonaka, and hence she doesn't dismiss you know, Yui's passion for that role and instead gives her some really good advice on how to do her best in it. Basically, I want Nautica to become Prime Minister of the world, like, ASAP, and uh, I will wait patiently for that day to arrive. So moving on, it was a riot that everyone in the class voted for Mio because of their image of how cool she is. And uh, I think Evan David again is right on what's going on that either they're all Mitsushippers like me or they are Mio fan club members who voted their idol into that role so that they could vicariously imagine themselves being romanced by Romeo with the Ritsu serving as their proxy. Yeah, either theory works for me. Um, we're also blessed with the rare sight of both Ritsu and Mio breaking down at the same time. Usually it's either one or the other, like when Ritsu freaks Mio out with her horror stories or like that rare time that Mio tortured Ritsu with those anonymous love letter lyrics. But here the whole situation causes Mia to blank out and say things like, well, Papa's moving the whole family to Erdkutsk. And you've got Ritsu pissed off at Shakespeare because, well, the blasphemy of being pissed at Shakespeare um, because of how hoity-toity it is. And it was just, it was great. When the other girls suggest Ritsu be more girly, so basically be more like Mia and vice versa um, in the way that they act and dress, it just feels so wrong and you immediately feel that wrongness, which I think is a testament to how deeply the show has gotten us to understand these characters. But amidst all the jokes and the gags, um, there's a serious through line that shows off the solidarity between uh, Ritsu and Mio. So Gabex in the comments mentioned that, well, everyone except those two know that they're in love with each other, but also Ritsu with her assertive actions always knows what's best for Mio and Mio trusts Ritsu. And you see that in one of my favorite episodes 
uh, no, one of my favorite moments of the episode, which is when they're walking home together and Mio suggests that maybe they should just quit. And Ritsu stops and then rips out her blouse and orders Mio to put hers back in the normal way and just refuses to do so. She's like, do you really want everyone else to keep making fools of us? And Mio hilariously just replies, well, I have no problem with that. But no, Ritsu does and they're going to push through and conquer the world. I do appreciate that Ritsu generally knows how far to push Mio. Occasionally she does break her a bit, um, but she's always there to, you know, help put her back together and does know when she's crossed a line. Um, I also want to register my appreciation for the multiple on-screen Ritsu smiles that we got whenever someone complimented Mio. Like, for example, those customers in the maid cafe who said that she was really cute. So I thought that was interesting. Speaking of the maid cafe, HTT once again proving the super strength of their friendships because all of them working on a Sunday just to keep me your company in her confidence training. So other things I loved about the episode, Nakano. So we got a little bit more of the Ritsu as a dynamic that we didn't get as much of back in episode 16 when as I said, gets to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with her senpais. Um, I really enjoyed, as I said, giving Ritsu a hard time over her Juliet role. Even when Ritsu had her in a headlock, as I said, was still like laughing, so she's fearless, clearly. Their particular relationship gave me a vibe of like the head of a clan being lovingly tormented by their successor. Um, as I said, just really walking a comfortable line between respect for a strong senpai and polite but sharp teasing, which is awesome to see. Of course, it was also great seeing the other girls in class 3 to get involved and being able to get glimpses into their characters. Uh, Passive Bot dropped an interesting factoid that Himeko Tachibana, who was one of the girls being voted to be Romeo, um, and who sits next to Yui, apparently has a cult following for being the most gorgeous background character in the show. Um, I think it's just such a great thing um, about the K-On fandom that given enough depth of story, even characters who get very little screen time, you can just run wild and, you know, fill in the details yourself. And, I mean, oddly enough, I really want to know more about Ichigo her yada when Ritsu tries to rope her into playing Juliet instead of her was just perfectly delivered and uh it's just so much character in that tiny word which brings us to I guess the episodes we've all been waiting for there's been quite a bit of hype for these next two episodes and if I've learned nothing else I know to expect great things from episodes that are being hyped in the comments so here we go. All right, guys, uh, get comfy, grab your coffee or water or whatever is your preferred drink. And let's do this. Um, episode 19, Romeo and Juliet. Okay, if you guys are good, let's do this in three, two, one. It's probably the highlight of his day, <laughs> those girls walking in. <laughs> Same. Cuties. Uh, they're so badass. Ugh, that trill will always be my favorite part. I love the synchronized dancing with Yui and Azusa as well. Oh. 
I love the kicks on this drum bass. It's like on every single beat, it just makes it so hectic. It's a great message of not being afraid of imperfection, you know, just, just do your best, have fun. <laughs> oh, Azza says so cute. I can't believe she wasn't even in the show for the first like seven or eight episodes. What do you call that um, traditional Japanese outfit? Is it is it a yukata? No, that's probably not right. Oh, she's still worried. Oh. I didn't catch if their live show was after or before Romeo and Juliet. Must be after. Oh, I see Ichigo. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, speak again. <laughs> oh, that's um, Tachibana. She's choking on a fake pumpkin. Yui's, Yui's just trying to help. Oh god. No, I probably wouldn't disturb Sawako right now. Oh, as I said, she feels I'm a little bit left out of all the drama and all the action. <sighs> oh, the play is today and then the live is tomorrow. We're definitely getting more of these three together. Wow. <laughs> uh, school fates in Japan, so wild and amazing. Vampire cafes too. Why aren't they showing her face? <gasps> oh, oh god. <laughs> they look perfect. Perfect for each other. <laughs> it is a little bit weird for the mind, given the, you know, roles. It's even got a saber and everything, the sword. <gasps> oh, 
Sakave, number one fan. Oh, here we go. Cute. Mm. <laughs> be gentle. She looks like she's gonna puke. She'll be fine. Oh no. Yeah, this has kind of consumed all of their energies. But of course, they'll prove to Azusa that they do care more than anything. Ugh, nervous. <gasps> Mill killed it. Is that what Azus is worried about? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Do they have to kiss? <laughs> okay. Uh, don't have a heart attack now. Oh God, Yui. <laughs> it's all right, she's practiced. She's born for this moment. Oh, made it a lot better. <laughs> what if they're stuck forever in these roles? Oh, that tone in Mio's voice when she goes on the lower register is amazing. It's quite something. Gravestone missing. Oh, that is very seminal in Romeo and Juliet, like at the last scene. Nautica is still sounding so calm. Crisis management. Hmm. Maybe they can. Maybe Yui could be it. Like. She slayed Tree G, so she could probably be the gravestone, no problem. <laughs> Some music, so dramatic. It's getting the heart rate up. <laughs> oh no. Hedge H. <laughs> I mean, the audience won't mind. God, I wish we saw more of the occult club as well. Oh, 
Oh, who's that freaking out in the background? <laughs> Using the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> Oh, I got chills. What? Music is great. And also, they've been rehearsing since they met each other, basically. Oh no, as is uh... Hey! Oh, her fan club. Man, they, they killed it. So proud of these girls. As I said, being all alone again. <laughs> Honey, we're home. It's like a dog looking for like affirmation. The boot on its own. Oh, look at all four of them just staring at her. It's like their little baby. It's having abandonment issues. Oh, okay, Yui. <laughs> uh, I can still hear Yui, like, mumbling her love. Damn, we're gonna stay here overnight. Oh, I wonder what outfits that she's got planned. <laughs> okay, I didn't get that crane wife reference. Oh, it's actually pretty fun, like staying overnight at school for a big show. We bring the bento boxes. It is at last live. Make the most of it, right? <laughs> she sounds like a predator when she talks to Azusa. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> Man, not a car.
I think she was always like that. <gasps> That's weird. I mean, Jun can stay, right? I'll never get tired of that five bag shot. Okay, they're making some great memories before the last show, which is which is awesome. Yes, more of the occult club. Like a horror house. <laughs> that purple light. Still worried about the aliens. I love this cross club interaction. <laughs> I love how Azusa's in her red, you know, junior outfit. I'm going to toilet paper the school or something. <laughs> uh, as I said, it's just so used to it by now. She doesn't really react anymore. Still in the animal slump. <laughs> Oh man, they're just throwing all these references from previous episodes all in this one last night. Just kind of going back through the category of memories that they have. Yeah, see, there's just no reactions, just like whatever. It's so cute. As a song. Ooh. <laughs> oh, she loves her. <laughs> oh, boy. Ah, oh, you used to like press up against Azusa. That's cute. Fear of rejection. Again, I love that it's Ritsu speaking for the team. 
<gasps> oh, club shirts. Uh, as I says, stayed up so late last night thinking about how this is the last, I guess, the last time with these girls. <sighs> oh, it was great. The play was great. Um, everything that happened after the play was it's really built on um, how much the Light Music Club means to the girls, even though they were occupied with other things. And of course... Uh, this ongoing feeling of Azusa being left behind. It's building up to a really emotional moment. Oh, no, I don't know if I'm ready. I like that how they have like each of their own pins. What does it say? And it's a yeah. The use of the sky, like little objects that open out into the sky, is really cool too. Oh, she's eating another pumpkin <laughs> from her hand. Okay, let's go to episode twenty. Okay, we're gonna kick off episode 20, yet another school festival. Um, all right, let's give this a play in three, two, one, go. They drew on her palms? That's so sus. <laughs> Person. I mean, drawing on your friends at a sleepover, if one of them happens to still be sleeping, is a must, right? Oh man, this the drumming section for this song is it contributes so much to the hecticness. It's actually kind of similar to the second OP as well. And you know, we talked about how the snare goes on the two and the four, the weaker beats, it just makes the whole song kind of very unstable and hectic. This part always makes me sad when they're thanking, I don't know, each other and the audience for being with them and loving them. <laughs> like she's surprised at this point that she would punch her. And Yui probably legitimately thought that it would actually make a difference. <laughs> oh God. Oh. 
the special made cafe training. What's Yui gonna say? <laughs> oh man, they've got their own HTT uniform. Oh, that camera motion down the stairs and then out the window was really interesting. Kind of references like the opening the door out into the sky that the ED does. Oh no, the rice bowl incident. God, all these memories just come flooding back. How <laughs> they all quickly moved back to their positions. Oh, God. Oh, that was a bad drop. They're all wearing those shirts over their uniforms too. Oh, is Nautica wearing a shirt? <laughs> That's right. Best teacher. Like that one time, it's not anything weird or fetishy. It's just, oh God. <laughs> she did good. Oh man, she's crying already. <laughs> She's like, word, cheering. Oh, the rice song. I love how you can hear the amp in the background, just very faintly. Oh, they're actually using the actual lyrics they showed previously. Carbohydrates and carbohydrates. <laughs> so silly, but this is a great song. Whoa. <laughs> what the hell? Da, da, da. Ah, yes, we got that line, that genius line. Nice bass run up. Oh, and they're including the audience clapping along. Da, da, da. That's a really difficult interval jump. Ah, oh, they're getting into it so much, the audience. Oh my god, the entire stadium is wearing their shirts. 
<laughs> Damn, that was that was hard. That was badass. I love that chromatic scale right at the end. Oh no, don't make it worse. <laughs> Kakoi. Do something. <laughs> They'll cheer at that. Just say it to Ritsu. Nice. Yep. She uses that uh, more lower tone of hers really well. <laughs> oh, this first time we've seen her actually get up and come towards the front. The classic line. Does Mugi have to do something now? <laughs> it's the HGT comedy act. <laughs> Just... Oh no. You and I? Oh, I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> Ui is just like, more. I think she ate it. Oh, okay, so they're going through the other songs first. <gasps> Ichigo. Oh, she was on those handing out the shirts. Wait, aren't those the customers from the cafe? What? <laughs> At this point, we've heard the end of Four Four Times so many times. Oh, well, she is, she's part of the club. She's part of the family. She's such a Chad, so go sensei. I mean, the entire school is literally wearing shirts that she made. <laughs> A little fangirl screams. You already said that. <laughs> oh. I think everyone knows that because they're all in it. Oh, they're going through all the characters. <laughs> oh, the way they're doing this really feels like the end of the show. Like one final curtain call. Uh, 
Oh, Maggie even gets her own like fangirl screams. <laughs> so cute, like holding her cheek. <laughs> Eyes. So adorable. Even Tonshan gets a shout out. <laughs> Come on, be cool, be cool, Azusa. Yeah, there's no no ego there, which is what I love. Wow, they're all saying their part. Oddly, it feels like it's also aimed at the watches of Kaon as well. Like presenting, these are the characters that you've watched for all this time. Thank you for, you know, appreciating them and watching them. <sighs> oh, oh, no. Does Ui get a shout out? <laughs> I'm surprised Ui hasn't started the Yui fan club yet. Man, loving all this applause that they're getting this whole episode. We're out of time. Uh, so meta. <laughs> There's so much thanking going on. Oh, even Jun gets a shout out. Nice. Love room <laughs> confirmed canon member. <laughs> Crickets. Oh, so much hype. Oh, I love those synchronized guitars. Oh, the song about Ui. Oh, Moogie, nice. I wish I was in that mosh pit. <laughs> Uh, we... That beautiful harmony with me and Yui.
Uh, I mean, it's a song about Ui, but it also just covers everything, like the relationships in the ACT club and how they found family with each other. Uh, I can't wait to listen to the full song. Oh. They did well. It's just all that adrenaline. <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, even Azusa fell into that hole. So quiet. <laughs> Mickey's legs is having a little temper tantrum. <sighs> no, all this talk about the future is killing me. Is Neil crying? <laughs> Even Ritsu's crying. <laughs> Oh. They cried themselves to sleep together. Sorry, I'm finding it a bit hard to speak right now. That emotional assault <laughs> when they all started crying together, like one by one. Actually, I think it was Azusa who was the only one that wasn't crying and she was the one that was wiping her tears from Maggie's face 
which is ironic because in all the episodes leading up to this one it's been Azusa who's been like tearing up and crying and at the thought of this being one of their last lives um at school anyway I just feel so drained right now <laughs> Right, I'm gonna take some time to recover. Oh man, that hurt. How we doing everyone? Oh man. We started this reaction all smiles, but now I've got like I feel something stuck in my throat and you know what? It's good that we still have a couple more episodes to go plus the movie. Um I do feel though that these episodes let out a lot of pent up emotional build up probably because the writers knew that if they had left it all to the very last episode uh, we'd probably collapse from emotional overload so we got to be grateful for that a few quick thoughts i i actually i really liked how a major bridge between episode 19 and 20 was the other girls in the class Continuing on with how episode 18 showed us just how involved the students are with each other, like even though we spend the most time by far with the HTT club, they don't feel isolated at all from the wider class. And seeing all the other girls in the play and having them panic over the missing tombstone, getting the occult club to donate their Rosetta Stone and then later becoming friends with HTT girls and you know who even promised to go to their lecture on um I think it's like cow mutilation yeah all of that created this sense of camaraderie that worked really well in episode 20 when they all wore those HTT club shirts um and if we hadn't been given those bits and pieces and clues on how well the class knows the HTT club and just how much they know about how far Yui, Mio, Ritsu, Mugi and Azusa have come, I don't think it would have been as impactful. Um, also, especially when Yui does her hype man thing and starts thanking everyone who's ever supported and contributed to the success of their band. The other thing that getting a better insight into the girls of class 3-2 is that it helped me feel much more a part of what was happening at the live performance which is a weird thing to say but I guess um oddly it was just kind of cool to rock along with the songs with the rest of the girls in the audience you know when the audience yells things at the girls you know words of encouragement or laughs at them you kind of do it with them which makes the experience feel so much more real. You know, like the other girls in the class, we've watched the HTT Club grow from its inception and we've seen all of their struggles and troubles and we've come to know them so well as these fully fleshed out characters. I guess we share the same investment they have in seeing these girls do well like i totally want that hd t-shirt just to make it official another great and really touching link between the episodes was the difference in azusa's emotions so in episode 19 with the drama surrounding the romeo and juliet play um azusa was feeling completely left out and you see her worries about that you know, just being left behind and not really part of the main action resurface. So she's worried that maybe the other girls don't care as much about the club anymore and that they're moving on to bigger and better things and their very busy lives. And then, of course, after everything's over, the four empires surround Azusa and comfort her and you know tease her a bit as well but they make it clear that the light music club 
is and has always been a key part of who they are. But then there's the flip in the next episode. God, that last scene after the performance was... I've said it already, like a full-on emotional assault. Um, They had given their everything on stage and afterwards it was just so quiet. And the realisation that they just rocked out one of their last um, school festival performance, um, that just like hit like a truck. And what really upped the the feels of that scene was they were playing um, a softer, more emotional version of you and I, of course, the lyrics, which basically talk about how, you know, it, you're the reason that I'm here and, you know, I couldn't have done it without you. All of those mushy feelings just uh, put musically in that scene, which was a killer. It's also so true to actual performances that, you know, where you work your ass off to do well and then you kick it out of the park and afterwards the adrenaline, the adrenaline is gone and it just feels like a dream which has been also such a strong motif in this season and something just breaks inside of you and that's when the waterworks start, especially when you know that it was the last performance. So sure, there are going to be um, other things that come along and life doesn't end in that one moment, but it sure feels like it at the time and you just kind of wonder how are you ever going to top that moment in your life but the flip I mentioned is that here when all the other girls are breaking down and crying and you know Yui's got snot all over her face Azusa is calm she's actually the one comforting them now telling them to you know don't cry like a baby even though ironically she's the baby and it feels like she's really worked out her emotions um, at least a lot more than what she was you know a couple of episodes back and she's a lot less anxious now about the girls graduating I think you know whenever the last last performance is Azusa will break down also but it's good to know that she's worked through a lot of that anxiety and is capable of being strong and I guess carrying on the legacy of the HTT club even after the era of Ritsu Mio Yui and Mugi comes to an end and uh yeah just to finish off uh, I've got to go back and count all of the references to the previous episodes that were thrown into these two episodes particularly at the live performance just really taking us down memory lane and it's so crazy how when they mention something even if it's in an offhand way you know, something in my brain will flash up and it'll be like, oh, they're talking about that time when so-and-so did this and it was really funny, it was really heartbreaking or whatever. And that is such a good, I mean, it's such a sign of good story crafting. The fact that I would remember things that happened a while ago as if these characters are living, breathing people with histories and with futures and you know, as we've learned, is the most important thing to appreciate with presence. The songs, I have to talk about the songs. Um, I'm sure you guys are going to have some very interesting notes on those, but my first impressions. So the rice song, which I think is called Rice is a Side Dish, uh, which is such a ridiculous but ridiculously cool title. Um, It was everything I wanted it to be. It had that Ichini Sanshi Gohan punchline and it was just wacky and fast and hyper um, with lyrics that aren't all that deep but they didn't have to be um, it's just a good time song and it will forever change the way that I eat rice which is like every day <laughs> um, you and I you and I was so warm I think is the word I liked that it was at a slightly slower tempo, although still very upbeat, um, because it gave it a little bit more emotional depth. Um, I really enjoyed the chorus, especially not just the lyrics and all of the memories that they conjure, but also the 
melodic line and hearing Mio and Yui harmonize with each other um, while, you know, just giving each other these happy looks and just having the time of their lives. It made me think actually all the way back to their first live performance when Yui had forgotten her lyrics and Mio had to jump in and was right there to back her up. So it was just nice seeing our two lead singers be so comfortable with each other and I've always loved the contrast in between their two voices and when you mix them together it's just heaven. So that's it guys, uh, I hope you had a good time and that you're not too emotionally wrecked. Thank you again for watching with me and uh, make sure you're taking care of yourselves and next time we'll be back for episodes 21 and 22.